They call me Squirrel. What's going on over here on the hey, with Squirrel Down Under? Down Under? What's going on? How are you guys doing down under? Doing all right? Today we're going to look at the animated history of Australia. It's a little seven and a half minute video. It's going to give me a little bit of history. So at least I have an outline and a base of what the hell I'm looking at. Because I have no idea what's going on over there. I'm learning every day. Every day I'm learning something. Trying anyway. So today I'm going to learn about the history of Australia. Maybe. We'll see. I mean, I think I'm going to. What do you think? You ready? Let's do it. Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Macrobius believed that there was far too much land in the Northern Hemisphere, and that there must be some undiscovered continent balancing the globe somewhere in the south. Okay, so the logic was a little flawed, but during the Age of Discovery, the search was on for Terra Australis Incognito. Fast forward a few centuries to the East Indies. Three Dutch sailors landed in Australia accidentally in the 1600s. The mythical southern continent had just been found. Australia was the last of the New World to be discovered, because let's be honest, nobody cares about Antarctica. Australia was of course already <laughs> inhabited. <laughs> Who gives a shit, right? This is the last one. We don't count that shit. Indigenous Australians, also known as Aborigines, had a population of between 300 and 700,000 by modern estimates. Early contacts with these tribes were as often peaceful as they were violent. It is thought that these groups arrived in two stages. The first was from the Indian subcontinent via a land bridge that connected Australia to the island of New Guinea, bringing with them the Pama Nyuangan language family. The second wave was much later and may have been groups related to the Austronesians of Indonesia. Their culture and history was preserved through the oral tradition. The Dutch named the island New Holland after the county of Holland in the Netherlands, but it wasn't until the British landed on the east coast and named it New South Wales that Europeans began to settle. Landing in Port Jackson on the 26th of January 1788, hey, that's today, the so-called First Fleet arrived to found the colony of Sydney, with the intention of using the labour of prisoners to achieve wealth for Britain. However, contrary to Australia's convict founding myth, less than half of this First Fleet were actually convicts. In the 1800s, Australia was circumnavigated, mapped, and new colonies started springing up all over. Hobart, Newcastle, Launceston, Port Macquarie, Brisbane, and Melbourne, with dozens of penal centres. Adelaide and Perth were founded as free settlement cities, but the latter was made into a penal colony after it failed to grow naturally. As the Europeans expanded, the frontier wars began with the Aboriginals, many of whom were hostile to the foreign invaders. Most famously, the Black War of Tasmania, which nearly... That, that didgeridoo in the background just... It just sits on your soul. The whole way I can just feel it in my body. <laughs> ...wiped out the indigenous Tasmanians. But far more destructive to the Aboriginals was smallpox, which killed tens of thousands. Australia's growth would stagnate until the 1850s gold rush, which drew hundreds and thousands of settlers from all around the world in search for wealth, particularly in New South Wales and what would become Victoria. This would forever change Australia's character, with new free settlers overshadowing its convict past, bringing with them their ideas of European enlightenment, the American self-determinism, and the Chinese hatred for the British? These gold diggers became discontent with the corrupt and badly run colonial elites and rose up in rebellion in the infamous Eureka Stockade. These settlers were beginning to feel a sense of nationalism that perhaps Australia could be something different. The winds of change were on Terra Australis, and soon large-scale trade unions developed in Australia's largely working-class population from the ideas of orthodox Marxists. Trade unions still hold a significant influence over Australian politics today. But let's not forget the rift that had been forming between Australia and Australians, the government and its people. Thousands of ex-convicts were being released each year, most of them turning to civil jobs, but a sizable minority turned to Australia's bushy frontier for freedom and profits. Policing was harsh, but order couldn't reach far enough. Outside of the cities, only personal gain and wealth could drive law enforcement. Money would change hands and lips were sealed. In this climate, an Australian icon was born, Ned Kelly. Famous for his tin hat Robin Hood thievery, infamous for his cop killing and town raids, and recognisable everywhere for that nifty bulletproof suit. For more on one of the most well-known cornerstones of Australian folklore, come to my channel, Feature History, and check out my video on Old Ned. 
Okay, so besides bulletproof suits or whatever, most Aussie colonies were granted self-governing status and united to form the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, a dominion of the British Crown. The new Australian government was very quick to open up a new dark chapter in Aboriginal history, the infamous Stolen Generation. Beginning in 1905, the government began rounding up half-castes, a term which is now highly offensive, and settled them into white families with the intention of breeding out their Aboriginal blood in a form of cultural genocide. Abuses of these children were also rampant, which is a rather depressing segue into the White Australia policy, a set of strict settlement acts which restricted immigration from anyone who wasn't British or Northern European up until about the Second World War. As a British colony, Australia would unilaterally declare war on Germany during the First World War, forming the Australia and New Zealand Army Corps, or ANZACs. The young nation was sent headfirst into war. Around half a million soldiers volunteered, or nearly one-tenth of the total population. The baptism of fire came during the Gallipoli campaign, when more than 8,000 men lost their lives in the failed invasion of Turkey, an event etched into the memory of the Australian zeitgeist. Although crippled from the Great Depression, Australia again took up arms in 1939 to support her mother nation in the Second World War, this time fighting in Europe, North Africa, the Pacific and South Asia. Prisoners of war in Malaya, Burma and Thailand were treated inhumanely by the Japanese, who also bombed Australia's northern coast about a hundred times. Australia is still a very young nation, but it has emerged a very powerful force in the region, now a beacon of democracy, social progressivism and commerce with its phenomenal urbanization consistently ranked among the world's most livable cities. Walking the line between left and right with generous social programs, universal suffrage, a welcoming immigration policy, and attractive business prospects. So that was uh, the animated history of Australia. Actually, uh, learned a lot there. Um, God, the early 1900s were not good. Whew. That's crazy. Um, Anyways, I just uh, I want to dig in a little bit and learn something. You know, I, I, I'm trying to learn about Australia and uh, and its and its neighbors. So uh, yeah, there we go. At least I learned a little more today. Every day I'm gonna learn a little more and a little more and a little more and a little more. And I'm gonna do some other stuff, not just learning, but you know. But I thought it would be interesting, you know, interesting and important to get these get these uh, these looked at and uh, get a little more knowledge in my brain. I don't know. I hope you enjoyed it. I sure did. I'll catch you guys soon. All right. Scroll up.